Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel. Watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 19th of July 2014. This is episode 20. Slight delay, sorry uh, for that. This was due to some work commitments, but um, it was worth waiting in some ways because of the developing news uh, that seems to be changing every day. Uh, obviously, the latest news um, is being dominated by the Malaysian airliner, which has come down, MH17, yet another Malaysian plane. I'm not a great believer in coincidences. I think there could well be some connection here. I don't know what it is, though. There's been a lot of chatter on Ukraine's social networks about who's responsible for this. Could be the rebels, could be Russia, could be Ukraine, could be Western governments. I wouldn't put it past Western governments, to be honest. I've completely lost trust in our, in our government, so who knows what's going on again, yet again. So basically all, all the uh, world's eyes are on Russia at the moment. Apparently there was an unexplained change of course of the Malaysian MH17 flight, which took it directly over eastern Ukraine war zone. Whether that's true, again, we can only speculate. But um, I think we'll be talking more about this particular incident. I don't know enough of the facts at the moment, but there's something extremely odd about this. The people who who um, are most likely to benefit will be Western powers because, as I said before, regarding Syria, it seems to me they're intent on going to war or creating a potential World War Three. They really, really want it. And, you know, whether they would use this as a, a way to um, put that into practice, I don't know. But it's my opinion that they desperately want to go to war because of the money that's going to be generated or for other reasons. Let me know what you think about that, but it just seems to me that they're just intent on, on creating a war somehow, somewhere. They don't care where. They tried it with Syria. It didn't quite work. They need public support, um, which means that's that the power is in our hands. If we can make it clear every single time they try to do this that we don't want a uh, World War Three, you know, they can't do it without us. And I think um, we need to make it clear that we're not going to accept it. No matter what they do, no matter what instance they create, and this could have been created, who knows? I don't know at the moment, but certainly very odd. Hope to be going to Ukraine in a couple of weeks, so I'll find out what the opinion there is, maybe. Then maybe moving on to Thailand, not sure yet. I'm just making plans at the moment, but let's keep an eye on this story and see what develops over the next few days and, and see whether there is an investigation, because there needs to be, but it, you know, there's been talk of of people um, already taken away some of the debris and uh, going to make it hard to maybe find out exactly what happened. Um, also uh, in the news there's been a lot of talk about the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict with a ground assault apparently going on over there. A Palestinian family and an Israeli Bedouin father were, were among those killed on Saturday um, as the casualties continue to rise on both sides. UN Chief Ban Ki-moon is heading to the region to help mediation efforts. Uh, in the week's news, um, police brutality. On Thursday, uh, Eric Garner, a Staten Island father of six, was killed as at least five New York Police Department officers attempted to arrest him. And this was a big guy. I don't know if you've seen the video, but um, he was trying to make it clear to the officers that he, was, he wasn't doing anything wrong and they should just leave him alone, which is often the case. Anyway, they didn't leave him alone. They put him in a headlock. You could hear him saying, as with other videos I've heard, uh, he was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. You can watch this video on uh, YouTube. Anyway, they killed him, basically. And, um, they'll, you know, I'm sure they'll get away with it. There's often nothing done about that. I think it's unacceptable, personally, and it's happening too often in the States. And it wouldn't surprise me if this becomes a bit more regular over here in the UK as well. Over here in the UK, MPs have voted through the government's emergency legislation giving security service access to people's phone and internet records. Of course, no one's going to kick up a fuss over here because everyone thinks it's fine, but I think it's going too far, personally. I don't think, um, I think we're all being treated like criminals these days, as can be seen at airports, where, you know, uh, where we're virtually strip searched. I mean, literally, in some people's case, it hasn't happened to me um, yet being strip searched, but. I think um, they're conditioning people to get used to that kind of criminalization of the public. 
So there is a uh, child abuse scandal over in here in the UK at the moment. I think uh, Parliament is doing its, its utmost to try to cover this up. They brought in a lady to um, conduct the investigation, but people weren't standing for it. It was quite obvious this woman has a track record of covering up incidents in the past. She was actually in charge of the Lady Diana investigation, which was an ob obvious cover-up. Anyway, there's going to be some people hopefully brought to justice. Whether they're going to manage to cover up the bigger ones, I mean, I've heard names such as Leon Britton and um, Kenneth Clark. These are names that have been banded about. You know, I'm not, I'm not um, alleging anything at the moment, but, you know, if these powerful people have been involved in things that were untoward, then they need to be brought to justice. Let's just move on quickly to our roundup of last episode. We were talking um, to Lorraine, Lorraine Fenton about super soldiers and mind control. And we're going to continue that today with part two, just to let you know about uh, topics coming up in future episodes. Could include world disasters, honor killings, mysterious celebrity deaths, time travel, the Dyatlov Pass incident, religious cults, and any other news events or any other topics that you suggest or um, uh, happen to be interesting. I've been listening to Hagman and Hagman a bit this week and Alex Jones. Alex Jones has returned to reporting on things like this plane disaster, which I prefer to hear him talking about, talking about as the focus um, for the last few weeks just seemed to be a bit too much on the immigration and border problems in the USA. Listening to Hagman and Hagman as well, always like their shows and I'm hoping to steal a guest or two from them, but I will return them. So let's just talk about mind control again. Basically, um, the principles of mind control uh, hypnotic suggestion, mental programming. It crops up in advertising, but also on TV, in, on the internet now. And it's um, controlling people's perception and people's ideas and beliefs in um, the wide population. Most people don't pay conscious attention to the things that affect them subconsciously. They don't always know what to look for. But when these things are pointed out, they can be recognized and understood. I mean, mind control is a very important issue. The kind of mind control I'm aware of, and the things I associate with mind control, is things like um, advertising gimmicks such as Coca-Cola, who write messages on their cans. I was drinking one the other day. Um, they write messages such as dad, uh, bro, friends, and sis, like sister. Uh, it's to make you associate Coca-Cola with things that you love. Personally, I think there's something quite repulsive, repulsive about that. I, mean, I, I almost think that, that should be illegal, to be honest. It's kind of disgusting that they're using, they're trying to manipulate your thoughts so that you, you, when you think of the love you have for your family, you start associating that with Coca-Cola. Um, I think that's disgusting, personally. Anyway, uh, then there's association... Um, such as um, Clarence House, the people who look after the PR for the royal family, that they, they use. I mean, I noticed this week there was an article um, linking Prince William with this downed MH17 plane saying he was in mourning for the passengers, which I'm 100% sure he wasn't in mourning uh, for those passengers. And it was just basically an article to make people think, oh, you know, very caring royal family we have. And um, it's just typical. Uh, there won't be anything negative said about the royal family. Always positives, always caring, always looking after us, always bringing the tourists in. I'm not a big fan of theirs, as you may have guessed. Um, as, as I mentioned before, also with the, uh, the Sun newspaper, who are a great form of mind control in the UK, since I would say there's, you know, they've got hundreds of thousands of readers, and a lot of people do base whether they even realize it themselves, they do base their political views on what they've read in the Sun. I mean, the Sun, the Sun newspaper has its qualities in that, you know, some of the other newspapers can be a bit serious and boring. So at least it's kind of a bit more entertaining. But, you know, I just wish they had a bit more responsible reporting. And, you know, they've got they've got such a large amount of people that read their their articles that it would just be nice if they didn't create such a dumb population which they seem to be doing regarding uh, super soldiers as well as um as well as soldiers in the military being physically strong there's been a lot of research and uh, much military interest in the creation of sort of human terminators 
who perhaps also uh, through mind control feel less pain, less terror and less fatigue or could be trained to feel less of these things and whose bodies could be strengthened by using sort of machines maybe or merging with machines. If you think the idea of super soldiers is a fantasy, it might be worth you conducting a little bit more research into the subject. I mean, the Pentagon obviously think it's an interesting topic. They're currently spending about $400 million a year researching ways to enhance the human fighter. So um, we're going to go to part two of um, our chat with Lorian Fenton from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, she's involved with UFO communities. Um, she talks about the paranormal, mind controls. She attends and sometimes leads uh, super soldier summits. She talks about black ops and um, she's also involved in bookkeeping and marketing and PR, uh, PR person for psychotherapists. Anyway, she was uh, talking in part one. We talked about a lot of interesting topics. She's going to carry on now in part two. And um, if you've got any comments or any questions about the episode, please don't forget to leave comments under the video. Sorry about the abrupt ending to this episode. There was um, I was in Ukraine at the time and someone started banging really hard on the door. It was late at night and uh, they were trying to tell me to shut up. And I, so I just had to leave in the end. But um, anyway, here's the next part of Super Soldiers and Mind Control with Lorian Fenton, part two. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt my story because this is very important for anybody out there who thinks they have a, a, a super soldier, mind labs, uh, mind control, anything going on with them. The biggest problem they all have in common is they get in stuck into this place that I call the loop. And it, this loop is, why is this happening to me? Who can I talk to about it? How, who's going to fix it for me? How can I fix it myself? And they loop around in their mind constantly because they're programmed to do that. And you have to understand you've got to break free from that. That is the main number one thing you have to do if you're a victim of any of this. You have to say to yourself, it doesn't matter. Who cares? I'm going to get up today, and I'm not going to think about it, and I'm not going to give them any energy, juice, energy, thought, whatever. I'm going to go to a dance class. I'm going to go take a pottery class. I'm going to go to work all day. I'm going to find something I love to do, and I'm going to ignore anything that they're trying to put in my head. This is the most, um, uh, most important thing you can do for yourself because 90, I'd say 80 to 90% of the people there who are in this pro in these programs they are usually doubled up in their parents basements no life nothing going on they don't leave their house and they're totally controlled by these people that sounds a lot like um the kind of people who t tend to end up um committing some of these um atrocities that we hear about like you know Ad exact adam, adam lanza and that um what's that guy's name holmes um James Egan Holmes, who did the Colorado uh, shootings, yeah. That's exactly it. Exactly. And I could go into m much more detail, but maybe we'll save that for another show about Adam Lanza and, and the Naval Yard shooter and uh, the, the Colorado guy. I, I mean, I have so much information about all that, but that's, that's for another day. But anyhow, you guys, this is the most important thing you've got to realize. And it, it saved me. It absolutely saved me because I've had so many things happen now. Granted, when I go on with my story here, I've got a few more things to say about what happened to me. But because of that statement at the very beginning of all this, I I am free. I, I, I don't have any problems with it. Um, and there's another part to all of this that I'm going to tell you guys at the end on how to protect yourself. So it's very important you do that too. But um, you've got to not let... You have to be stronger than them, and you have to say, it doesn't matter. And you get up every day like an alcoholic, and you say to yourself, okay, it's a new day, and I'm not going to let anything that anybody else does interfere with my existence. You have to take control of your mind. You have to not let anybody else have control of your mind. Now, um, anyhow, I'm going to go on with my story, and then I'll, get, I'll go back to how to, to help yourself with this, okay? If that's okay with you, Scott. Of course it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyhow, so we're sitting there talking to them, and we leave, and so I'm I'm pretty freaked out at this point because I'm thinking, yeah, wow, you know, I'm going to put on a conference maybe, and they're all interested, but now I've got the screaming in my head thing, and I, you know, I'm a little freaked out. The next day, we, oh no, this is where it really gets interesting. Got out. See, I always blunt this part out, and this is probably the most important part of the whole story. It's Saturday night. We get back to the house. We're up late. It's about two or three in the morning, and I go to, I forgot to check my email that day. So I pop open my laptop. I'm sitting on the side of the bed in this house that we've rented the rooms to stay at. And I pop open my laptop and I think to myself, just, I wonder if Asolaria remembers the day the helicopter came over the house. Okay, I'm just thinking this. I don't know why I thought it, but I thought it, you know, because it was, I was thinking of her and, you know, just stuff. And I, and I thought, oh, yeah, the helicopter thing was really weird, right? So I'm thinking it. The second, you guys, now it takes, what, me, you know, 30 seconds to tell you all this. It took a fraction of a second to think it. In that fraction of a second thinking it, there is a helicopter over that house as loud as loud can be. Okay, and I'm now, I sit, I'm sitting on the edge of the bed, and I am totally freaked out now. This is like, what the heck is going on? And I'm just, I, I'm frozen. I'm thinking, now, wait a minute, what, what's happening here? I just thought this, and now there's a helicopter over the house, just like the last time? And I'm like, oh, my God, i got to get up and look at it. So I, I walk to the center of the bedroom, and I still am not, I can't get to the window. And I finally force myself to the window, and I look up, and I'm looking for a helicopter. I don't see a helicopter, but it's pitch black, so, you know, it's hard to see. And what I end up seeing, you guys, is... Uh, three ember red lights, like you know, a coal fire, you know, a, you know, a fire, that red ember looking light. I see three of them pretty high up in a triangle formation, and I'm thinking to myself, "Whoa, wait, wait! I'm looking for a helicopter, and I'm seeing a spacecraft." You know, I'm like, "What?" And I can't see the outline of it. All I can see are the three lights. So I'm not even sure it's a spacecraft at that point, but I know it's something that doesn't belong there. And a side note to all this is, since that happened to me, whoever is in control of, of our minds on a, an alien abduction or alien sighting uh, scenario is erasing that picture from my mind. I have to wake up every day and remind myself I actually did see it because they're erasing the, the whole incident from my mind. So every day I get up and I go, picture what it looked like in your head, um, find pictures that look like it so you can refer to them, and don't forget it really did happen. Okay? Because they do this to people. They make you forget anything you really saw, and they make you question whether you really saw it, and then you get to a point where you just don't believe it even happened. Okay, and that's a sidebar to all this. Okay, so I'm looking at this. I back up into the room, and I'm totally freaked out, and I just go to bed. And okay, <laughs> people go, why did you just go to bed? I go, because I was just like, whoa, what do I do? You know, what, what do you do? I have nobody to talk to about it. I just got to go to bed. So I get up the next day, and I ask everybody in the house, um, did you hear the helicopter last night? And they all said, no, we didn't hear a thing, and they had just gone to bed. So I know that they, they would have heard it. I don't think they fell asleep that quickly. And that really bothered me too because then I'm starting to wonder, did somebody just put that in my head so only I could hear it? Or was it really there? Now, in my brain, I kept thinking I saw people reacting to the sound across the street when I looked out the window, like lights flicking on and dogs barking. But maybe the dogs were barking anyhow and it had nothing to do with me hearing that sound. Or maybe that sound was really there and everybody was hearing it. I will never know. But I think now, looking back on it, that they probably projected that sound into my head as I thought about that. And they were there instantly, okay? So this is just really too bizarre for my brain at the time to handle. So, okay, we go back to the conference. And um, I needed to speak with Bill Ryan about one of my clients. I was repping four or five people at that time, Douglas Dietrich being one of them. And I was talking to Bill and Carrie about doing interviews with them and blah, blah, blah. 
So I'm talking, I'm looking for Bill. I find him after a presentation. He's sitting in the front row. He has this young gentleman kneeled down in front of him, and they're both meditating over this cube device. And I'm fascinated by this little cube device, and I'm watching what they're doing, and I'm just kind of meditating with them. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm just standing there going, ah. Oh. So we were just a minute of silence is kind of like what it was. Finally, they stop meditating, and the, and the young man jumps up and says, oh, great, here, you can have the cube. And, you know, he's talking to Bill. And I said, Bill, I really need to talk to you. And he goes, oh, okay, just give me a second. He had to, to do something with his girlfriend at the time. And uh, the, the young man there looked at me and he goes hi my name's james rink and i'm a super soldier and i heard you're putting on a conference for us and i'm like oh i am okay well that's interesting uh yeah i said i, I might i don't know what's going on with that but maybe and i said meet me out at the table out in the lobby after you know in a half an hour or something and he went yeah sure okay and he took off and uh bill and i talked and uh, i got busy listening to to you know speakers and i've completely forgot about poor james and uh it's late at night and i'm packing up the table with Solaria and we're talking about the day and suddenly James shows up, and he's standing in front of the table, and I'm looking down, Asa Laria starts talking to him, and I look up, and there's a gentleman standing in front of the table, and it was Max Spears, and he's one of what I call the light warrior super soldier guy, and I look up, and I, and I had another whoa moment, I just about fell off my chair, I looked up, and I said, my God, I know you. And I did. I recognized him from somewhere. And it was just killing me. It was one of those horrible, horrible deja vus where you're like, I know I know this guy. Where do I know him from? You know, it was just horrendous, uh, horrendously deep. That's what I tell people, like irritatingly deep. And he I, he goes, well, I don't know you. And I said, that's okay. <laughs> I said, I look down again and I'm like, whoa, what is going on with me? Because, you know, here I am, this old lady, and this is a young guy. He must have thought I was some freaky old, you know, cougar or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I was just like, I was embarrassed and everything all at once. So we finally, we were talking to the guys who are helping us pack and we, we get out to a table out in the, the courtyard and, and um, we ran into a bunch of friends and we were all talking and talking and talking and hours later I said, hey, you guys hungry? Let's all go get some dinner. And they said, sure. So I called the person we were staying at the house with and he's making us dinner. Great. Okay. So we all ended up back at the house. Now I... I'm listening to Max. Uh, James is talking a lot to A. Solaria. I'm talking a lot to Max. Max is telling me things about the Nazi programs and a bunch of Satanistics. Oh, I forgot about this. Satanism is a huge part of this whole mind control project, too. So, I mean, uh, the mind control projects. And uh, he was telling me things. And as we're talking, I'm getting sick. I'm getting physically, my stomach is not feeling well. I'm just, I'm having a really hard time talking about all this stuff. And I didn't know any of this stuff, really. I mean, I knew a lot about psychic ability. I knew about all that because I'd been involved with it most of my life. But this whole black thing, this whole black arena, I was not part of. And I was just not handling it very well. And to be honest with you, Scott, every time I start talking about this, I, my throat starts closing up, and it's really hard for me to talk about this last piece of this. So bear with me if I sound like I'm choking here. Okay. <laughs> because this happens to everybody who's had a true experience, by the way. Um, they cannot, it's really difficult to talk about it because they put all these blocks into you so that you don't talk about it. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there so people understand what goes on with this. Um, anyhow, so I'm talking to him. We have a great night. In, any, in spite of all this, I learn an immense amount of information. Um, and they leave. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning again. I'm getting up at 8 or 9 to drive A. Solari and I back to San Francisco. And this is where I had my major uh, recall moment, I call it. Um, a, a lot of people call it, you know, a... Um, what do they call it? See, this is where my brain starts going out whenever I talk about this. Um, yeah, I would call it a recall, a flashback, a vision, whatever, of what may may or may not have done been done to me. Um, what happened is I started to wake up that next morning, and I felt myself like I was being pulled to watch a, uh, watch my brain as a movie. 
And so all my attention in my physical body is into my head. And at that point, I start seeing a room and then I'm in the room and I'm holding on to this guy and it's Max. And uh, a lot of sex, a lot of love, a lot of uh, extreme emotion involved in everything that goes on in the first part of this. And I'm very attached to him. I realize that he and I are merging into this, uh, I call it love bombing. That's what a lot of the people call it. Um, Eve Lorgan, who's written The Alien Love Bite, calls it this. It's where you're programmed physically and mentally to be interconnected with somebody's consciousness. Okay, and this is something they've been experimenting with for quite some time, and I want people to know it's true. And do you mean, it does do you mean, um, do you mean like also when you when you meet someone occasionally, you you seem some people have a real connection. You know, occasionally you meet people in your life, and you just you have a real, real close connection almost instantly. Is that the same well, kind of thing? Well, this I would say it's like that a thousand times more. And because those type of connections are spiritual connections that are organic, that are real, these type of mind control connections are not. They do this to people to make them uh, what we call twinning them, putting them together to use them physically or mentally for some purpose. Um, and when in doing so, and I, here's the kicker, and I usually don't go into very much detail about this because Max and I have decided that a lot of detail is not good for the America, <laughs> for the public out there internationally or in America or anywhere else. But um, because people who are, have had these things happen to them, it's also good that we hold back a lot of it because when they tell me something and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about because it happened to me in this vision. Now, I'm not even sure this was ever real or in this dimension okay but um, definitely uh, anyhow I'm going to go on with it because I, I it, it gets really hard to talk about so the faster I get it out the better it is so we're being twinned into this uh, program or whatever it is they're doing to us and then the next thing I realize is that I am naked and strapped to a chair and Max is in front of me having sex with another person and this is the kicker I'm not going to go into all the details about the you know everything else but this is the real kicker everything he's doing I can feel everything I'm feeling he can feel so <laughs> and there, there have been experiments like that though haven't there with people like uh, having uh, someone's um, finger being hit with a hammer and another person in a, another room uh, is is put under an illusion that it's happening to them. I mean, there are experiments going on like that. Exactly. Thank you for that. See, there are very few people that acknowledge that that type of thing does happen, but this is an extreme experience. And here's the real part that really freaked me out, is I'm 17, or I, I know I'm 17 while this is happening to me, okay? And I know that Max is 22, I know this. I mean, I know that in the vision, in the place, wherever I'm at, and this is happening. But in reality, I'm 53 at the time, and he's 33 in this 3D reality. So were we taken to a different dimension? Was it all my imagination? Um, and I tell you, folks, I don't have those kind of fantasies. <laughs> That's not something I'd ever had in my life. People go, ah, oh, you just woke up and you were having, you know, some kind of fantasy. You know, I'm like, no, no, no. I would never have thought about all this. And I'm not even telling you guys all the details. I mean, the details about the guys and the uniforms and the, you know, I don't know all the stuff that was going on. I would never in my wildest dreams have that fantasy about Max. You know, my fantasies are much more normal, like, you know, let's have some sex fantasies, you know. Uh, nothing like that. That is just like, it was so far out there that when I came out of it, and this is the real hard part for most people to understand. When I came out of it, it was like I had just lived a whole relationship with somebody. And I was 
really devastated by the experience um, emotionally. It took me, I, I cried for four hours, almost four hours. Yeah, Isolari was freaking out. She didn't know what was wrong with me. I told her I didn't feel well, but she kept saying, why are you crying? I go, because I'm in pain. She goes, where does it hurt? I mean, it, it was just a, a long thing. I gave myself a migraine headache from crying so hard. Anyhow, um, it really tore me up it, instantly. I mean, I was a wreck. I, I just didn't even know what to do. And, um, and I, it, the worst part about this is when this happens to people, if they have this kind of experience, they really don't have any help. There's not, and I didn't know who to go to. I didn't know who to talk to. I thought maybe I was losing my mind. I needed to see a psychologist, you know, blah, blah, blah. I really went through a major stuff in three hours, uh, and crying the whole time doing it. And finally, I said to myself, and this is where I got to thank Miranda again and again. After I kind of stopped crying, I said to myself, wait a minute. Do I really need to know about all this? Do I really need to let this affect me? And thank God I did that because I, I got myself together. I packed up the house. We got in the car. I drove home. And I didn't think about it. I just said, oh, yeah, don't think about it. And it won't, won't affect you, you know, of course. So I get home. And it takes me about three months to really wrap my head around everything that's happened to me. A lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of trying to figure out what this was. And the closest I could come to it is that. And this is only a, a probability, and I got three of them. Number one, that when, as a child, I was used in some kind of breeding program with the super soldier programs they had going on at the time. And that possibly there are some children out there um, in these programs that might have some of my DNA. Now, that's the physical reality that could be going on. And the only reason I even came to that conclusion was because, um, or one of my conclusions was that um, I had done a little bit of research into my past, but I realized that I belong in uh, I, the Fentons, which is my last name, um, that whole clan is part of the Stuarts and the Pruitts and all of the major clans of Scottish, Irish, English, and French over there. Um, and we're pretty much straight bloodline from, you know, most of the, the higher up mucky clans. <laughs> So I thought, well, maybe. And also my grandmother had a very psychic gift, and I've always had a, a pretty psychic gift. So maybe they needed something from my – I used to uh, show dogs. And when you breed dogs, you always have to kind of go out of the strain a little bit every couple generations to make sure they don't fall apart. Well, maybe in these projects, they have to bring in some kind of uh, DNA structure just to keep these guys being more psychic or more strong or, or healthier or whatever and I thought well possibly they were you know I was used in this and I and I don't know about it my parents don't know about it or whatever this is a definite could be possibility that's number one number two was that this is a dimensional thing and that they're mind controlling me into believing that's what really happened and then the third possibility is that um, I'm just nuts and that uh, I made it all up. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think so because I'll tell you what, having to live all the emotions that go with it, I just don't think so. So anyhow. Uh, most most, what most people who are nuts um, don't ever entertain that conclusion anyway from what I've, uh, what I've heard. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so there I sat, and that was that's pretty much my story in a nutshell, and it put me on my quest. And I, in a weird way, I I think that I was predestined to do those conferences, and that this was just like the opening floodgates for it all to happen. And I've gone from the Super Soldier program as a focus in the very beginning of these conferences, all the way to adding in target individuals, and my buddies are time travel, and dimensional people, uh, experiences, and you know, I, I, I've now encompassed so much more, and that's why the, the, the conferences turned into what I call mind control conferences, because really, you look at the big picture, uh, the super soldiers were just the beginning for me to understand all this. But you know what I really believe all these people are? I think they're dimensional warriors. And I, and I use that word very, um, uh, you know, heavy because I want people to understand dimensional warfare is really, I think, where we're at at this point in time.
and I believe that the people that are doing the mind control on the 3D level here in this planet are know about it. They know about this dimensional warfare and maybe you're trying to tr to transform us into being able to work in that dimension. Um, maybe just to deal with aliens in this dimension. I don't know. And you know, I know that sounds really crazy, Scott. It sounds like well, no, I've lost. Actually, um, I think I think maybe twenty years ago it would have probably sounded more crazy. But you know, these <laughs> these, these days these days um, it seems like science is actually sort of coming around to this way of thinking of dimensions. I think there's a lot of scientists that talk about a universal theory that involves a certain amount of dimensions. And uh, then you've got Stephen Hawking's um, last exactly. week I think came out saying. Um, he he was he was convinced there there is life on other planets and you know when you've got the the great minds of the world sort of saying no these things are you know entirely possible um, you know and, and I I heard a scientist uh, some time ago saying that uh, he thought that the chances of us living in a um, and a, uh, a universe which is simulated are probably extremely high when you've got scientists um, who are considered to be that, you know, the most intelligent amongst us sort of talking about dimensions and um, simulated universes and, and aliens on other planets, then people can't really just make fun of it, can they? I mean, it's, there's got to be some something in, in, in it. I agree, but I think we're still at the baby step stages of this whole phenomenon. And because it is very complex, like, you know, you asked me about super soldiers. Well, it goes really deep in many directions, and that's just the super soldiers, you know. If we uh, put a big mind map on a wall and we put in the spider web with all the different tentacles coming out of it, uh, you know, covering, we would cover that whole wall with the, how many dimensions there are and layers to this type of uh, phenomenon. And, uh, you know, you can just go the, the regular 3D route all the way to the dimensional route. So you've got that. It's like you're playing a 3D chess game all the time in this arena. And uh, it's so hard for people to grasp and understand. And, and you know, some people just want to say, oh, there's just this type of mind control. There's just the, the, the physical scopolamine uh, hypnosis. And that's as far as they've gone. You, you're nuts thinking it goes beyond that. And I tell people, no, no. Uh, they're tapping into your consciousness and who knows where our consciousness can actually take us well I was just going to say you know like um, in the uh, the 40s and 50s when M MK Ultra uh, were doing those experiments there must have been people in that program who were being um, tested upon uh, without their knowledge who were talking to their friends saying you know it's really strange I, I, I uh, you know it seems like someone someone tried to erase my mind the other day I was in some kind of laboratory and uh, I don't really know what's going on and th their friends must have said to them you're bonkers you know but it turned out they were telling the truth and some of them are, are seeking compensation now exactly you know I tell people all the time the Manchurian candidate the movie the old black and white one very very real very real and then the new one with Denzel Washington I think it takes it to another whole level for people if they're really aware of what they're seeing in the very beginning of the movie it shows uh, he's sitting in a chair and, a, and he's seeing a belly dancer and colors and and all kinds of strange things like he's on acid you know having an acid trip he's hallucinating and um, so what's really interesting about the whole the whole movie that I, from my perspective is he's seen all these hallucinations at the beginning and they get all the way down to the end of the movie and what was really happening in that moment is that he was drugged he was being hypnotized and he was sitting in a chair and there was a guy in a white lab coat standing next to him and that's it and uh, people need to understand that the reality of what's going on and the perception of how they let you take it back to your reality are very different than what could be happening here on a 3D reality. So, um, Has there been many whistleblowers uh, from the military coming out sort of saying that this is all going on? You know, not a whole lot. That's what's very difficult about this. We're, we, I mean, we've only had a few people even come out from like uh, Papoose Lake Area 51 to talk about the fact that there's spaceships and that they've had aliens out there. And nobody believes them. And we've only had a few over the last 20 or 30 years. 
uh, do you know about the Phil Schneider? Um, oh, I know all about Phil Schneider. Yeah, yeah he, I, know, I remember watching a documentary, and he was saying all his friends were being killed, and that uh, you know he was involved in some underground bases, and and then he got killed as well, or at least he died, you know, in, under suspicious circumstances. He did die under some very suspicious circumstances. So. Um, Yes, many people are killed. That is a, that's a horrible reality of this whole thing. And I'm trying to say something that's very important that people need to understand. You can protect yourself from being killed in this business. Um, I have gotten some amazing advice from Jordan Maxwell. I don't know if you know who Jordan Maxwell is. But he is one of the best or the most well-known conspiracy theory guys here in the United States and has been for about 30 or 40, 30 years now, maybe 40. And he gave me some amazing advice when I figured this all out. He said, Lorian, you know, you've got to ask for angelic or spiritual protection. He goes, I don't know if you believe in it, but there is another dimension I believe in it. And by the way, I've been to that other dimension. I've been to the dimension of pure love and light. And that's, a, you know, that's for another day, another story. But I believe an angel or an alien came by the side of my bed and touched my forehead ever so lightly as I was falling asleep and I was taken to a place. I remember waking up the next day and they did not let me remember why I was back. But I was back and uh, it was horrible being here because the density and the lack of love and compassion on this planet is absolutely amazing. And anyhow... Um, that opened my eyes, but that was a long time ago, long before I realized any of this mind control stuff was going on. But anyhow, Jordan said to me, he goes, you know there's another place. I know you've been there. We had talked about it. And he goes, you've got to ask for protection from the people who are the guardians of that world. And, and I said, I will, I will. And he goes, and he told me how to do it, and I did it. And, you know, right now I feel very protected. And I tell this to anybody who thinks that they're having any kind of experience with aliens, if they feel like they're being mind controlled, if they feel like they're in a project, they're being used against their will, if they're in the satanic cults, if they've got you, I mean, anything, you've really got to just beg. you really got to beg from your heart, your soul, and every core being about you, you've got to ask for protection. And you will be given protection. I thoroughly believe that. I believe anybody who needs it, who is involved in this, will get that protection. So be sure to do that, folks. If you're having any problems, go out to a very nice place in the woods. Uh, go to a place away from people. Don't do it in your house. Don't you know, do it away from people. And you got to ask for the protection, and then you've got to be very specific about what you want. When I ask for my protection, I ask to have my house and my being wherever I traveled to be protected in the same way. And I was given that protection. I actually could see it in my mind's eye, the type of protection I was given. So um, whether you believe it's your spirit guides or what angels or whatever, it doesn't matter. But you really have to be very, very sincere. Very sincere and you've got to ask for it. And you've got to do it. And you've got to be very specific about what you need. So, and it will happen, I promise you all. Whether you believe in God or not, you'll get something from, and it may be another dimension, I don't know where it's coming from, but there are, are entities out there protecting us people here on this planet from the evil that's being perpetrated here. So, and I do believe in evil now, Scott. I never did before this. I was 53 years old, and I really believed that people made their own destiny. And I believed that good and evil were kind of an, uh, an outcropping of your destiny. And uh, I had no idea how much the other influence was out there on humanity as a whole. So, yeah. Some, sometimes I think humanity as a whole, it could be. Um, one giant experiment. I mean, no one's no one's a hundred percent sure what's going on down here. What, what you know? Maybe we are part of all part of uh, one one big giant experiment. The whole planet, you know, and our lives. And uh, there's you know at the end of it, maybe we find out what's going on. 
Well, you know, that's what I tell everybody. I have a presentation about the whole weekend of awakening, and at the very end of the presentation, I tell everybody this. I said, you know, you may never have the answers here, and you can't beat yourself up looking for them while you're alive, but I can guarantee you, and I can guarantee you this, the second you're dead, you're going to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to know everything. So, um, yeah. I, I just think most people um, want to believe that um, when they do die, that there is something good out there, that they don't wake up and and they are surrounded by people prodding them with uh, forks and stuff, you know, that there is uh, some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. I believe that if you are a very evil person if you have chosen that for yourself if you, that is how you live your life by torturing others and and uh you know that type of thing i did you ever see the movie ghost yeah i did yeah mm -hmm. and i love that movie i think it's a lot like that i think if you're an evil person and you've done some horrible things to all the people around you you do get some kind of hell out of it and it may not be the prodding and poking and what have you. It may just be that you have to go to a holding cell somewhere to be re reincarnated back here again until you get it right, you know? Well, that, that, and, that means these MK Ultra guys that have been doing all the experiments, that's where they're going to end up, surely. Well, you bet. And they'll probably come back here and be experimented upon. Sorry. That's my real... I believe in karma. That's another thing. I really believe in that. I believe if what you give out, you get back. And I can almost guarantee you this, Scott, I, it's, I'm 99% sure that I don't have to come back here again. <laughs> Unless I volunteer. But I don't think that's going to happen either. Well, I'm, glad, I really... I'm glad you came back so you could talk to us today anyway on our show. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've almost died so many times. It's amazing to me. I keep thinking about this. And uh, I'm trying to write a book right now about my life. I, I, did, I really thought that my life was normal like everybody else's until this all started happening to me. And then I realized I started looking back on all the different things that have happened to me in my life and how I got here. And uh, it's just, to me, it's now starting to come together as a giant puzzle. And a friend of mine says it's fascinating, my life. So, um, you know, I am putting a book together. I think people might find it interesting. I don't know. But, uh, I, you know, I started out trying to commit suicide at 18 months eating rat poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> and I always laugh because people go, why, you know, how do you, why do you say you committed suicide? Why did you say you were stupid and you ate rat poisoning as a kid? I said, because if I, I must have known what was coming. So I was trying to get out of here as fast as I could. <laughs> oh, anyhow, so that. There was some rat poison in this hotel that I'm standing at the moment. Oh my God. Oh dear. I hope they're not bigger than dogs, those rats. I haven't seen, I haven't <laughs> seen them yet. I think I've just heard them. Just oh dear i know i hate the, that uh, the roof yeah you can hear them oh it sounds like you know they're having a party up there sometimes so yeah, well, i guess the company's nice sometimes yeah well anyhow um i i just i don't know what else to tell your audience at this point Do you have I just any questions to ask you, for me you, you you have a show uh the the, um, the fenton perspective is that right I do. I have a couple shows a week. I, I'm on Revolution Radio on Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific USA time. And it's all about politics and lots of fun things. And I've endeared myself to the United States government by calling for a revolution. And that everybody needs to build a guillotine and put it on the back of their pickup truck and take it down to their local, um, you know, uh, government buildings <laughs> and we'll have a day where we get rid of everybody just like the French did <laughs> right <laughs> but ours will be politicians not aristocrats so it'll be quite fun we'll get I'm, rid of all of them I'm not a big fan of politicians as either to be honest oh they have ruined the United States it's absolutely ruined it I mean ah oh, my god well it's just people... I mean, they're in positions where they could actually change the world you know and they're they're not they're, they're well they're changing it for the worse aren't they really exactly and you know what it all comes down to mind control people actually believe here in the united states that their vote counts that it's important to rally behind a party which is not it doesn't matter they don't care there is no parties it's all an illusion and it, the people actually believe that they can make a difference by talking about all this stuff they can't
Well, way beyond that, the Federal Reserve alone is draining this country just by being there and us being involved with it. It's that simple. You cut them off, you get rid of them, and the problem is solved. But everybody in America believes what they see on the, the news. They believe what the politicians tell them. You know, this is a mass form of mind control. You know, we get back to the mind control issue. Watching your television here in the United States is a major pastime for 90% of the people here you know the 10% that don't watch television are probably the most educated and smart people that we've got because they don't fall into the category of oh yeah I was watching Oprah or I was this or I was that or do you they don't even know who these people are and that's the way it should be and that's what they're hoping is that we never get to that point where we actually have time to sit around and question what anybody's doing here politically, what how our government is actually run, who's got the money, and this 100 people that own the world, the Illuminati, if we want to call them that, or the Bilderbergers, or the, the Council of 13, or, you know, whatever, um, you know, they don't want people knowing that that's there. That that's actually what's happening and oh gosh okay here I'm getting started about the mind control in schools I took an economics class when I was a teenager and I started looking at how money and, and economics works in the United States in the stock market and I realized in that moment it was all a Ponzi scheme you know and it's owned by certain people that have a lot of money to keep it bolstered up and then they put uh, you know shorts and puts and you know buy this don't buy that and they manipulate the whole thing to do their bidding and everybody sits around knowing that that's what it is and they still keep investing in it what does that tell you it tells you that they're either mind controlled stupid or or, or something's wrong uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk yeah. about um, just briefly talking about mind control in schools. That seems one of the most obvious um, examples oh, of mind is. control, really. I mean, everyone everyone's had that experience of being at school and or going to university for some people. And you know, you you, you do what you're told. You you write your essay, or for example, in the correct format, you write the established um, belief on the, the the topic you're writing about, and you're going to get high grades. Um, exactly. If you write your essay in a slightly different format, maybe you're a creative person. You wanna you wanna write it in a different way, um, and then and maybe you've got different beliefs to the established um, topic you've been given. Um, you write it in that way, you're gonna get low grade. So it's a kind of it's it's such an obvious um, form of mind yeah. control. It is. It's a total indoctrination. And one of the reasons that I, I became very much aware of school uh, mind control, if we want to call it that, or indoctrination or what have you, is because I went to a Catholic grade school. And my father is an atheist. My mother is a Catholic. When he married my mother, the Catholic Church came to him and said, you can only marry her if you promise to put your children through Catholic school. And he said, boy, he goes, that was the day, my father told me this when I was 13 years old, he said, that was the day I realized that they wanted to control your mind. And I said, oh my God, he goes, I w and it, my father and I, we talked, oh, my father gave me the book Psycho-Cybernetics when I was 13 years old. He says, this is an amazing book. <laughs> I, I can't remember who was who wrote that. It wasn't L. Ron Hubbard, but uh, I, maybe it was. But anyhow, amazing book and how to control your mind. He says what the Jewish, uh, I mean the Jesuit priests were trying to do at that time is control your mind. He goes, if you're smart, you'll realize that that's all it is. Catholicism, any religion is a mind control device. And this is my father talking to me at 13. Now, I was born in 1957, so that was 1970. He's telling me this stuff. And I knew nothing about mind control at its finest now. But this is, you know, the type of things my father would tell me. So, um, and I guess I had a different kind of education growing up. But I had, I had a very good education in the Catholic school. But I'll tell you what, once a week, they had a religion class. And you had to sit there and you had to listen to the whole thing about God and Jesus. And I'll never forget <laughs> I was in the third grade, and Sister or so Sister or May, I can't remember the nun now, but um, I'm sitting there in class, and she says this, and I, I think your audience will find this rather funny. She says, now, if you treat your parents bad, your children are going to treat you bad, so don't be part of the devil's plan. Don't treat your parents bad. And I thought about it, and I sat, and I stood up, and I said, Sister, uh, that 
so what you're telling me is that my parents treated their parents really bad because I don't treat my parents very good. <laughs> so she got very upset because I had caught the loophole. The loophole is if I'm treating my parents badly now, it's because they treated their parents badly. So it was a horrible thing to tell a kid who could actually think. <laughs> Yeah, they don't like kids who can think too much at school, do they? Yeah, no, not at all. And I found that out really young. You know, the minute you start voicing your opinion or catch them in their lies or whatever it is that they're they're professing, uh, they don't like you around at all. Believe me. Anyhow, so, yeah, education, mind control, uh, huge indoctrination. I always highly recommend that everybody homeschool their children. I think it's very important. And also, they have a curriculum you have to follow in homeschooling here in the United States. I'm not sure about Europe and how that all works, but um, here you have to follow exactly what they tell you or your kids don't get the certification so that they can actually go to college or get a driver's license because now, unless you're enrolled in school, you're not allowed to get a driver's license anymore. Yeah, they, they have ways of controlling it. I mean, they do try and suppress people who want to do homeschooling or maybe there's there's some alternative schools that have cropped up and they've they've started sort of taking away certain rights from those schools and making life difficult for the people who want to go down that route really yeah they have they made it very hard for a lot of people um but the people who are doing it are doing an amazing job um Partially, a lot of them do it out of religious beliefs, and that's okay. I, I'm, you know, I'm starting to be a little more lenient on the people who are indoctrinating their children through religious belief, because you know what? I'd much rather see somebody have some strong spiritual belief than have none at all in this day and age, because you know we're kind of to the point now where if you don't have something to fall back on that you believe in, when things start getting really bad, which I I believe they're going to, Scott. I you know I I hate to say it because I don't want anything bad to happen here in the United States or globally, but something bad's coming, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just this inherent fear of all of the uh, the fe how quickly we're we're moving in our technology and, and our thought processes and how every day is now a struggle with, you know, so much information and so many things to do. And, you know, just having a kid is a full-time job. It, it's not just, you know, having a kid and, and they go to school and you can sit there and read a magazine anymore. It's now, you know, they've got soccer, they got class, they got this, they've got an extracurricular activity here. They're, you know, they got games, they've got, you know, I mean... Plus, you've got to have all the money working to support those children in, in, in the style that they need to be taken care of. Because if children are taken care of properly, they end up in our prison system at some point because they were ignored as children, you know. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an amazing struggle to survive anymore. And uh, at the root of it all is the fact that people have lost their, their way spiritually, I believe, and also because of the, the evil people that run this planet are keeping us all as slaves. So there you go. They're controlling us. They're mind controlling us. They're making us all slaves to the dollar. Very tough place to be right now. That's a po positive note to finish on. Oh, gosh. No, it's not. It's terrible. But remember, folks, you can overcome all this. And I'll tell you, I, I, every day I get up and I, I feel blessed and I'm happy. You know, there's a lot of really horrible things in the world, but I choose to make it a more positive place. And I choose to help people get over anything that may be going on with them in the mind control. And I'm using quote fingers here. If you if you could see me, folks, I'd be like President Nixon, mind control world, because it all starts with just your cell phone, the TV, uh, school, anywhere. So, you know, we're all mind controlled. So just remember that when you wake up that we are, and you're, you're you. I'm Lorian. I, I get up every day. I'm happy. I have my two kitty cats. Um, I'm busy. I'm doing something important. I'm trying to change the world. And also, everybody out there, you've got to do that too. This is really key. The, the days of serving yourself and being selfish are over. Our, our planet has gotten to the point where there's no time for that anymore. You've really got to start thinking about the world 
and humanity as a whole. You've got to think, what can I do to help? Even if it's only donate $5 a month to your local, uh, like Scott's Truth Sentinel report, you know, to keep him going. If that's all you can do, hey, that's wonderful. That's a huge kudo because the more voices out there talking about how we can change the world for the better and keeping everybody away from this evil cabal that runs this planet, um, that's it. If that's all you can do, that's amazing. And tell people about Scott Show. Tell people about Revolution Radio. Tell people about anything that can change their mind and help them grow. I remember back in the day... Um, uh, when I first found out about Alex Jones. Now, I don't follow Alex Jones anymore because I, I, I believe there's um, a better uh, way to go about doing what he professes to do. But I was going to banks and pe I was talking to people about problems. You know, even when I'm in checkout line at the grocery store, I would say, hey, have you ever heard of a guy named Alex Jones? You really ought to check him out. Tr try to find him on your radio, you know, or, you know, whatever. And I would uh, turn people on to other patriots in the communities um, around the United States and say, hey, you know about so-and-so? You really ought to listen to him or, you know, whatever on the radio. And I would do this at the hair salon. I would do this at uh, uh, the bank. I would do it at my uh, church at the time. I do it everywhere I went just so that I I was helping people open up their mind to the possibility that this reality isn't the only one and that they can change the future. See, that's the bottom line here, Scott. We need to change the future. It's not set in stone. We can all do it if we all work together to do it and just keep everybody awake, aware, and aware that they are in control of their own mind. Because believe me, I think 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, we'll all be interfaced like the Borg in some way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember um, Obama said um, his campaign was like, change you can believe in, believe in and it obviously wasn't. But I think, I, think, <laughs> I think we really need to find change we can really believe in. And I, I agree with you. I think that we can change things for the better if, if, if enough people start to think in that way, you know, and start to have... You know, put more positive energy out out there. Open their minds, question more. Then I think there is a chance that we can have a better, definitely a better future than the one the one we're aiming for at the moment. Anyway, absolutely. And I think, and a great example of that was the Occupy movement, because I think they did a wonderful job uh, getting their voice out there. The only problem I ever saw with the Occupy movement is that they were doing a nonviolent Occupy, and I agree with it to a point, but folks, I think we're really at a point here, especially here in the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world, but here in the United States, we are right at that tipping point where it's going to become violent, and I hate to say that because I really don't want it to happen. I certainly don't want to be uh, involved in some kind of revolution uh, on that scale because it's going to get really ugly if it does happen. But um, the American people are too apathetic. They let uh, SWAT teams in their neighborhood looking for characters. They they do what they're told, and they're very apathetic about everything that's going on. But the 1% to 3% here that aren't are the ones that are going to have, eventually going to have to pick up arms and do something, you know, because what are we going to do? We can't We can't go on like this. I do. I, I do agree. I think um, people um, have got to stop and and change the way that they're being treated. For example, at airports, we're all being treated like criminals exactly. over over um, you know the terrorist thing, which is it's not actually borne out by facts. You know, we're all getting our deodorants cans, um, confiscated. You know, liquids and everything. And I, I yep. just think it's a massive, massive overkill. And um, you know, if people, if everyone just stopped and said, "No, you're not, you're not taking that," you know, um, you know, what are they going to do? The whole world would grind to a halt. They'd have to give in. It's uh, people power, you know. It is exactly, and that's you know, I, I don't understand why people do, can't. You know, they don't have enough conviction. They're afraid. You know, it, what it really comes down to, Scott, is fear. Fear really does rule this planet. That's what they keep us in. They keep us in fear. You know, people ask me all the time, aren't you afraid, Lorian? You know, you say things like we should have a revolution and build the guillotine and all this. Aren't you afraid? And I said, no, you know, I'm not afraid. I've died so many times I could care less about dying. And all they can do is kill me. And you really do have to get to that point. Believe me. 
the people in the American Revolution, um, uh, the the all of the all the wars that we've had, you know, you just get to a point where you actually say it doesn't matter if I die. Death is not the issue here. You just have to go out there and do, you know. And if death is the consequence, then death is the consequence. You know, people, they have been indoctrinated to be afraid of death. And it's too, it's sad. It's really sad. Religion was the first part of, of all the control about being fearful of death. Hell was uh, given to us as a fear of death, you know, the, the, that type of thing. I, you know, I could go on and on about religious control, but really that's what it comes down to, fear. People are afraid of everything nowadays. They're afraid of the cops. They're afraid of the uh, the bank. They're afraid of this. They're, they're just afraid. I don't even understand it because I've never been afraid of anything. But... Um, <laughs> I'm only afraid of one thing, and that's spiders. Um, spiders, exactly. Yeah, you know, things. my my favorite scene is in the Indiana Jones movie where he goes, "I hate snakes," you know, because that's me. I'm a, not a big snake fan, and uh, so you know, everybody that's brave has one thing they're afraid of, of course. But um, but I think bravery is gone. I don't know what's happened. People don't stand up for their convictions. They're not afraid to die for their convictions anymore. I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, it's a sad state, but what do we do? You know, we're trained now as children that uh, death and war are bad, but in the same token, uh, a lot of our young men that have no chance of ever becoming anything um, other than soldiers are pulled out of high school you know they're they're football players or they're this or that and they're they're sent off to war and these guys come back and they're broken you know because these wars aren't justified they get there and it just messes with their head i mean i can't even imagine being involved in a war that has no reason to be you know fighting for your independence from another country now that's a war that's a war i can get behind you know Fighting for your freedom, that's another war I could get behind. But fighting to for oil, <laughs> I don't even get it. Fighting for drugs, fighting for poppies and heroin, oh my God, you know. if, if and, and that's the other thing, Scott, oh my God, oh, I don't even know if I should go into this. How mind-controlled the populace is, especially here in America, about why we're at war in the first place. You know, if you just follow the money in any war, that's why we're there. It has nothing to do with anything they tell you. It has everything to do with where the money is coming from and who's profiting off of the war. And if people aren't smart enough to look at that, I really feel sorry for them. Because that's, people that's do the need to be line. smart. I mean, I remember the, the last time they tried to go to war in, in Syria, and, and they said, um, you know, they drew a line, which I think is, is a good way for them to try to start war. They draw a line in the sand and say, you know, if he uses chemical weapons, then we're, you know, we're, we're going to go in. Yeah, but people people um, didn't really stand for it. And and it, and it doesn't even make sense. I mean, the, the idea that Obama would sit up late at night worried about people, you know, uh, who've been affected by chemical weapons. But it doesn't even make logical sense because so he's basically saying that um, it's OK to stab people, to shoot them in the head, to torture them. But if you, right. if you were to use a bomb that, that actually burnt their skin, then I'd get real mad and I'd send in the troops. It doesn't make any logical sense. No, none whatsoever. Absolutely. Yep, I don't know. But at least we stopped that one. You know, I got to give uh, whoever worked on that, to, I got to give them great kudos for, uh, you know, stopping it from happening. But, you know, that's just one little victory. You know, they're trying to start another war right now. They're, so, trying, to, you they're know. trying to find another way around it, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, sadly, I think they, they they may succeed. But, you know, well, I mean, I think, I think people... The, ma the masses did actually help to stop that last time, so maybe we can do it again. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? See, th that would give me great hope if we could keep doing that. You know, that would mean that we've, we've hit the tipping point, that there's more of us out there that are consciously awake trying to stop this type of stuff than there are them who want to profit off of what they're doing. And yeah, I mean, what, what, if there, what happens here. if there was a mass sort of peace movement where people said, no, they're not standing for it anymore. And um, and they, they just couldn't they couldn't go to war anywhere. I mean, they'd be they'd be screwed, wouldn't they? 
Yeah, well, what I'm afraid they're going to do, Scott, is they'll do another 9-11. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a 9-11 here in the United States. It could be something over in, you know, London. It could be something in uh, Syria. I mean, they could do something where, you know, that makes the Twin Towers falling or nothing. You know what I mean? Mm, sadly, uh, sadly so I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll come up with some act of terrorism that'll justify that's what why it's important for us to keep exposing the idea of false flags, the idea that they're doing this, so that next one they, they do, people just don't buy it, you know? Exactly. And people need to be very much aware. You know, there was the, the, the shootings in Syria with the, the long-range missiles um, from the guys with the tanks. Oh, I can't even remember. This is like six or eight months ago. And I believe that veterans today exposed that. It was CIA actually in there doing the shooting. And that averted a war over there at that time. And this was before the last attempt. Um, you know, because they were doing these, not long-range missiles, but fairly long-range, you know, a mile, mile or two missiles off of these tanks and shelling different cities and places trying to get them to, uh, to come in and start a war. And uh, veterans today expose the, the guys as CIA operatives from, our, from America trying to get them to start a war over there. So, um, yeah, that was thwarted very nicely I must say I think um, I think some of the things that's making it more difficult for them to, to conduct their operations is the internet the internet and the spread of information is making it harder and that's why I think at the moment they seem to be trying to clamp down on the internet exactly I agree with you on that the internet is a two-edged sword as you know now, most people say it's, it's very wonderful for doing things like we're doing right now and having uh, my radio show. Um, yeah, it's just, it's an amazing tool. It really does change the world. Uh, YouTube is an amazing concept. There's one part about it, though, that, Scott, that's just starting to irk me. <laughs> um, everybody thinks that everything is free now because of YouTube. <laughs> I get lambasted for charging for my, uh, you know, conference videos of the speakers. Everybody's like, why, is, why isn't it up on YouTube? Why can't I watch it for free? And I go, do you think that I was able to put on this whole conference for free? <laughs> And I've got to make some money off of it, so, you know, no, there I you are. I kind of understand that, yeah. going to have it to go is. now, actually, because um, someone's knocking on the door, so... Oh, they're um, knocking on the door. Very interesting. Okay, dear. Well, hey, it's been wonderful. I hope we covered everything you wanted to, and thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you very much. So, thanks to Lorian. Apologies again for the ending. Um... As I did cut Lorian short, um, I, I did say this in the last episode, but let me just repeat. Lorian said that um, if you want to watch the second Super Soldiers and Mind Control Summit, go to mindcontrolsummit.com and click on the On Demand tab. You can get $10 off by using the code JOHN23. That's capital J on JOHN23. Okay, I'm going to leave it there mostly for today and just basically say that remember, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Albert Einstein was thinking of making um, Truth Sentinel t-shirts with some sort of slogans such as that on it. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. I'm always looking for sponsors, advertisers, advertisers that fit in with our ethos, of course. I'm not going to start advertising Coca-Cola, that's for sure. If you've got any questions or you just want to come and say hello, um, please email me at scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. It's always nice to hear from you. Um, as I said before, if it does look like um, this plane incident with MH17 is going to be used to try and start a war, Let's try and make sure that we spread the word that we're not going to accept this. I think um, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, no matter what propaganda they use, no matter how many incidents they create, any false flags or things like that, if enough people are against it and if we can march and protest like they did in the 60s and the 70s with anti-war protesters, there's no way they can do it without public support. We need to make sure that we're open-minded to what's going on and not conspir not not um, conspiracy theorists but people who don't accept uh, what's being told to us by the media always and that we question everything and um, just try to get our friends and families to do the same 
and not to be uh, led into wars that we're not interested in taking part in. So anyway, hope you have a good week. Thanks for listening again. Catch you later. Goodbye.